thanks to David and Maggie for uh, inviting us here to present today and also uh, for having my wife for a few and, and I for a few days. We've enjoyed our relationship so far and many more years to come. It's been terrific fun. Um, so my name is Ian Locke. Um, I'm here today really to talk about breed plan and how we use it in our herd as a uh, beef genetic evaluation system. Um, I'm from Australia, so you have to get used to the Australian accent. Um, and I come from the south um, east corner of Australia, uh, down here. That's part of the real, the more populated and more um, reliable rainfall area of Australia. Um, much of Australia, which I circle in there, is, is very hot and dry desert country. But we do sell bulls into uh, all states, including right into the centre of Australia. So th there's uh, bulls that come out of our Hereford herd that go into many different environments and some of them quite challenging. Um, I'm also chairman of what's called ABRI, or Agricultural Business Research Institute and uh, that provides breed plan. Um, so breed plan is what I'm going to be talking about a fair bit today. So today I want to cover a few things, but first a, a little about our herd. Uh, uh, I want to talk about genetics and why we need to change genetics. Also, can we change genetics? Uh, talking about breed plan and uh, talking about, at the end, a selection index which puts together uh, the traits of breed plan into a profit EBV. Uh, I'll have time for questions at the end. Um, we're a relatively old herd in Australia, probably not by UK standards, but uh, this year is our 70th birthday, and uh, uh, I'm the third generation to run the Waruna Pole Hereford herd. Uh, the, the thing that makes us a little different than what we generally see in Australia is that many years ago um, my father, who was the second generation to take over the herd, became very frustrated with the, uh, what we see in the pedigree registered cattle world of showing, of going to um, the royal shows and, and fattening up cattle and brushing them up and making them all look beautiful, but it didn't really reflect whether they were genetically superior or not. They were just uh, changing the environment to make them look better. So in 1972, we had a very much a fundamental change in how we ran our cattle from very traditional to um, being much more like our clients' herds who we're producing bulls for. So we started to produce our bulls under commercial conditions. Uh, that's generally grass-fed, uh, only supplemented uh, when, they, when we need to have maintenance because of poor season rather than grain feed all the time. And it's, it was a very big difference. However, it's, uh, it, we went into the wilderness for a while because it's very hard for the customer or the bull buyer to see that a bull that may be significantly lighter, that just for example, an 18 month old bull could easily be fed to 800 kilograms and look beautiful, but if it was raised on grass, it may only be 500 or 600 kilograms. Um, but it was hard for our customer to recognise whether a five or 600 kilogram bull was as good as the 800 kilogram bull down the road. And it was all to do with environment. And what we had to do is try and uh, teach and, and certainly uh, put uh, a lot of information out there for our customer to be able to work out whether, our, uh, whether the genetics of the bull was better or not. Um, and this is where breed plan comes in. To give you a bit of an idea of where we sit at the moment, um, we join about 800 cows a year and we carve about 600 cows a year. That doesn't mean there's 200 empty cows or open cows. Um, we do sell a lot of pregnant cows, but we, we just try to carve about 600 cows a year. 
and we sell about 200 bulls a year into the commercial industry. We see ourselves as a very different uh, seed stock operation and really I think it's summed up by, I often think of this quote, and that is that there is a conundrum in the stud industry and the conundrum is that the stud world can often afford to, cha to change the environment to suit their genetics. But the commercial beef producer, on the other hand, can only afford to have genetics that suit their environment. And I really think there is a, is a, is a complete different systems in the stud world to who they're actually servicing is the commercial beef producer in the end. And so quite often the stud world are always looking at uh, uh, changing the environment, adding extra cake, as I hear it being said here in the UK, adding extra feed to make animals look better all the time. And the commercial industry can't afford to do that. They've got to be running at, 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 um, at very efficiently and at low cost. And what drives the genetics in the start industry can sometimes be to, to the detriment of their client. So running, our belief is running a herd in the same conditions, the same, same commercial stress environment as your clients is really the key to uh, trying to produce the right genetics for those clients. Um, so the reason why we need to make genetic change is the same in Australia, but it's the same all over the world, I imagine. And that is that farmers' terms of trade are continually under pressure. Our prices that we receive for our livestock or any of our farm pro produce just doesn't raise, rise at the same rate as the cost of production. Our costs of fuel, our costs of feed, our costs of labour are going up at much higher rates. So that means that we have to become more efficient all the time. So that means we continually have to become more efficient. Um, and this is some Australian data, but it, it shows an illustration of how farmers have become more efficient over time. So in 1920, each farmer fed about 19 people. Um, and as urbanisation has occurred, as there's more and more people who live in the cities, I'm afraid the pressure on our farmers just keep increasing over time. And certainly, um, it certainly is illustrated that in 1970, tw each farmer fed 26 people. And now it's each farmer in 2019 um, feeds 230 mouths, and that's um, in Australian data. But that is the same that what's happening here. We have to become more and more efficient, and I believe one of the best, in the livestock industries, one of the best tools in our box to become more and more efficient is genetic gain. It's by looking for traits that have economic effect on your businesses, and uh, making gains in those traits, not at the detriment to other traits. So can we change genetics? Um, I think that there wouldn't be many people in this room, but there are a few people who may remember what are called the belt buckle bulls. So they were bulls that came up to your belt buckles, and that's an example of one in 1960 that was a champion bull somewhere around the world. In 2001, that was the sort of bull that became the champion Hereford bull. And uh, I think that's not many years in cattle terms, that's only 40 years or around about seven generations of cattle, that to make that sort of change I think is quite incredible, but I think illustrates the point that we can change the phenotype of animals through changing their genetics. We can make genetic gain. The key point here may be that the, um, we've got to make sure that genetic change is for better. Just making animals bigger doesn't mean we necessarily make more profit out, out of them. In fact, I would say the ideal animal is somewhere between those two. But we've got to make sure that the genetic gain is for economic gain of, of our businesses and of those of our clients throughout the beef chain. And that's not just at an agricultural level, but it includes uh, through to the consumer. The key 
to understanding how to improve genetics is to understand the difference between genotype and phenotype. Uh, this is a bull where we are looking at a combination of his environment, of how he was grown and how he was fed, and how he looks today um, has an influence of his genetics, but also a high influence of, of how he was raised. That bull, looking at how that bull looks is his phenotype. How do we know what his genetics are and the influence of, of what he's going to pass on? Because after all, all he passes on to his progeny is his genetics. Not, he, not any of how he was raised or how his phenotype. If he was bought a bucket of feed every day, his calves don't benefit from that. His calves only benefit from what's really hanging between his back legs, and that's his genetics. And my job as a seed stock producer is to be only interested in the genetics, because the environment part won't be passed on to my clients or others in the, in the beef chain. So when we look at a bull, we've got to recognise that most of what we're looking at is, is affected by the environment, and it's really hard to see the genetics. It depends on the trait. You can imagine if you look at coat colour, that's quite easy to see, black or red. That's very easily, uh, genetics has a large component of that and we see it easily. But when we look at other genetic traits like, how's the milk on the mother? How, um, what, can we see the genetics of the milk of the mother of that bull or the milk of his daughters? Can we see if that bull marvels? Can we see if that bull grows well at 200 days or 400 days? We can't see a lot of that in his genetics. We have a lot of environment influences that actually throw us off course rather than give us really good indicators. So that's why we have a tool called Breed Plan, because Breed Plan separates the genetics from the environment. So when we look at an animal's weight, for example, 70% of what you see in the weight of an animal is a contribution from the environment that he is. And, and the environment could be uh, whether he was wormy, um, how well he was fed, whether he had sicknesses at certain stages of his life. But about 30% of the weight of a bull comes from his genetics. So, uh, and once again, all I'm interested in is the genetics part of it. So we've got to try and separate the genetic component from the, from the phenotype. So the genetic com component is transmitted from one generation to the next, and this is what makes an animal valuable for breeding. Breed Plan provides estimations of individual animal breeding values, they're called EBVs, or estimated breeding values, for an animal, and it's included in the Breed Plan analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Breed Plan. Um, breed Plan is the um, most widely used genetic evaluation for beef cattle around the world. Uh, it's used by about 44 breeds. Uh, used in 12 countries, including the UK. Um, it has a database of over 40 million animals. So at, in any month, there's 40 million animals of different breeds being evaluated by Breed Plan. Uh, these are the countries that use Breed Plan. Um, so obviously, the UK is part of that, and Herefords in the UK use, utilise Breed Plan. Um, these are the breed plan traits, and I'll just explain them in groups. So you've got uh, EBVs for growth, which include birth weight or 400 day weight. There's EBVs for fertility, including scrotal size or days to calving. But there's also the calving ease traits I put under the fertility traits, because they're important for uh, uh, fertility and birth traits. Carcass. Um, they include intramuscular fat, which is marbling, or retail beef yield, or the fats, or eye muscle area. Um, there are some other traits, including docility and structure, uh, which not all breeds use, but there's certainly traits that can be measured, and EBVs can um, 
um, measure those traits. The important thing, I, I think this table is the crucial thing to understand how to utilise breed plan EBVs. Now please don't try and get to see all the information in this table, I just want to try and explain how it works. But this table has the heading at the top that says um, June 2018 Hereford Group Breed Plan. So it just means that was the, the run that happened about a year ago in June 2018. And it's the percentile bands for 2016 born animals. So if I pulled that table off the internet now, it would be actually 2017 born animals. And the reason for that is that if I was looking to buy a bull, typically they're about 18 months old or two years old, and they would be born two years, around two years ago. So you look at the, when you're comparing genetics, you go back to that group of animals that, that you're comparing the animals to that were born that would be 18 months old now or two years old now. Um, on the, the left hand side of this table we've got um, what's called the uh, percentiles. So here is the top 1%, 50% would be about average and the lower percentiles and you've got all the traits. Now the important way to use this um, table and I'll just give three examples is that if we were looking at an EBV for birth weight, for example, here, there is the birth weight trait, and the, that figure there says 4.6. So that adds to the 50 percentile mark. We know that the breed average for birth weight for that group of animals in the percentile table is about 4.6. Now in Australia, this table would would represent 20,000 animals that are being recorded. So 20, out of those 20,000 animals, around about 10,000 of them, 10,000 of them would have the birth weight EBV less than that, or, or 10,000 would have a birth weight EBV more than that. So the average is around is 4.6. To go to a, another example, if we were looking at 200 day weight, for example, and we had a bull that had a 200 day weight of 42, an EBV of 42, we would look up this table and see where 42 appears, and 42 appears equivalent to the top 5% of the breed. So automatically we know that the breed average would be down here, but if this bull has 42 for 200 day growth, he actually ranks in the top 5% of the breed. And I can give other examples, such as in this case, we can use an index where he's in the bottom 25% of the breed. So with, without having to get too into the table, all I'm trying to show you is as a tool, it is, this is, if you understand how to use this table, you understand where, and you see EBVs produced for a bull, you can use that table to work out where the bull sits if he's above breed average or below breed average, and actually in what percentile band he would sit amongst the genetic population. So a bull that had a 200 day growth, for example, of 42, we know he's in the very top percentile band for, that, for the Hereford breed for that uh, genetic population. If you understand how to utilise that table, I think you go a long way in understanding EBVs. Uh, there's been a change in breed plan EBVs in the recent two years which have been really important. In the past we have had um, EBVs and, and, and breeders like me submit pedigree information, who the sire is, who the dam is, and we present um, data such as uh, weights, birth weights or 200 day weights or, or uh, carcass data such as what Willie's doing over there in one of those sheds and that produced the EBV. In the last two years what's the important change has been that we now have what's called genomics and genomics is really measuring the genes so we measure the DNA or we actually have a tool to take DNA from an animal and 
we can work out what genes the animal actually uh, carries. So that information goes into EBVs through what's called a genomic matrix and that goes in data in like any other data, like weight data, like anything else. But the genomic data or the DNA is going in as another bit of information and it's having a huge effect on the accuracy of the EBV. It is now much more accurate than it's ever been before. And this is something that the UK, um, Herefords in the UK is transitioning into over the next few years, I imagine. Um, it's happening in the US where we've got, had it going in Australia for about two years. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it, um, as the UK builds its reference population of, um, of uh, genomically tested animals, um, it will happen for a number of breeds here in the UK. And it's a, it's a big difference. We have, um, for the first time, um, an animal with DNA um, assisted uh, uh, EBVs are equivalent to, our other, to animals that used to have to have, for example, uh, a dozen progeny on the ground to get the same sort of accuracy. So we now can pull a hair sample or take a DNA sample of an animal as a calf and get very accurate information on it to make better breeding decisions. That all feeds down to um, uh, commercial breeders having better tools or, or better, more accurate EBVs to make better breeding decisions. Um, I'm very strong, so at this stage I've explained what breed plan EBVs are. Um, the key is in any operation, it doesn't matter if you're a pedigree um, breeder like I am or whether you're a commercial operation, you really need a breeding objective. You've really got to think about what you're trying to do with your cow herd. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And, and, um, and what the market requires that you, and what traits you want to improve. And I think you all should be sitting down and thinking about your breeding objective and, and, uh, and what bulls to buy that actually go further for you meeting your breeding objective. And part of that is what bull source to go to that, align, that has a breeding objective that's more aligned with yours so that you can better meet your breeding objectives. So, um, and, the, and the thing is to, meet, to have a breeding objective, you need tools to be able to move towards them and that's where breed plan and, and uh, genetic evaluation comes in. So this is just a catalogue at our, uh, that we would have at our bull sale. Uh, we clearly state our breeding objective. Um, it's a bit small to read, but the main thing is that part of my breeding objective and my mission is to have fully described and predictable genetics. And the way we do that is through breed plans. So we're really trying to produce a bull that ends up being presented to the commercial beef producer which is very well described and, and, and that that producer is able to make a decision if that bull will better meet his breeding objective as, or not. So um, this is where breed plan uh, fits in. So my breeding objective is very much about having bulls that are well described. So breed plan therefore becomes a very much the foundation of our seed stock business. And uh, to provide better tools for our commercial beef producer, uh, the key for us is to, to strive to get very high quality data and, uh, and to use it as a breeding tool. And high quality data comes from things like, and you would have seen the calf wire out the back of the shed here, which the, uh, the Kellys use in their operation. Um, we will, we will weigh 600 calves a year with one of those sorts of calf weighers, which is this one here. Uh, we carve over six weeks and we can be weighing 50 calves a day when we're doing it. Something like birth weight is a really important trait to us. So we're, uh, we're trying to get, we, we weigh everything, dead calf, live calf, we make sure we weigh them. We weigh twice a day, every morning and night. So that's an example of a calf just born that we've uh, just weighed and tagged. 
We're also doing things like scanning, uh, like you see out here with Willie, who's doing the scanning uh, demonstration. Um, so that's scanning for eye muscle area and fats and marbling, those sorts of things. It's all about collecting data that give us better information to be able to present to our uh, clients. Um, we invest a fair bit of money in, in collecting good data because it's really important. Um, we, we do things like run all our cattle in large management groups. So as soon as you separate animals from your, your environment, uh, sorry, as soon as you um, separate cattle out of an environment into a different environment, you lose the genetic data. So if you want good quality genetic data, you try and run all the, same, all the cattle in the same environment because then if there's a difference in the animals, we know the environment's been the same, so it must be genetic. So that's how we try and extract the genetic component of information by running animals in large management groups. So, for example, we would be running 280 heifers in a group they all get weighed together, they all get scanned together, um, and that information becomes very valuable because it's not polluted by animals being treated differently. The worst case that you often see in the stud industry is people take out their best bulls that they might take to a show like the Three County Show or something, but as soon as they take those bulls out and they feed them differently and treat them differently and, and run them differently, you actually lose all the, the genetic data between those groups, or you lose most of it, because they've been treated differently. You can't compare them anymore. So it's really important to run in large management groups. We fully record all possible traits we can on breed plan. All animals, all traits. Um, we mature cow weight every cow, cow every year, um, the plus condition score and hip height, and all those sorts of traits. Um, we're, we're trying to collect as much data as possible so that we can identify those animals that are more towards our breeding objective. A big part has been this genomics that I've, talk, uh, I've mentioned so far. Uh, we've heavily invested in genomically testing all our cattle. In fact, 20% of the Australian Herefords that are, uh, that are measured are ours. So we've got, we're very well collected, uh, connected to what's called the reference population and uh, getting a really good handle on what genes are in our herd. Um, this has led us to be what's called a five star completeness of performance herd. And uh, that's been very rewarding for us because clients are able to have this system that actually rates how well you um, collect breed plan performance information um, gives your clients a good idea of how accurate the data will be coming out of those herds. So um, uh, that's been very useful. Um, you can use, now that we know we can, I've explained breed plan, we've talked about how you can use, use the tools. We use it as um, a benchmarking tool. So we're able to to look at traits, and I'm not going to show you all the traits, there's about 22 of them, but I'll go through a few. You can see over the last uh, 25 years, this is the birth weight trait in our herd. And you can see that the green line is the society, so that's about 20,000 animals that I was mentioning before that are, that are born in that year, two years ago. And this is our average herd, uh, our average for our herd. And years ago, about 20 years ago, we used to have a calving problem in our herd where we were assisting or dystopia in the herd, we were pulling too many calves. And that just showed in the data. We, we were above the breed average for birth weight and we were having too many calving issues. So I use breed plan um, to select bulls in the future and I just made sure, I, I, I say I put a foot on birth weight, I didn't want to have birth weight much different than three, and the breed continued to get higher and higher birth weights and got more and more problems with calving ease, and uh, we were able to sort our calving ease issues out within our herd. Now you can see that the breed has got a lot better and they've certainly woken up to that fact. 
but it's something that uh, you know we can all do in herds or as a commercial beef producer look for herds that are uh, trying to improve their traits. Calming ease is obviously heavily affected by birth weight, but calming ease is the direct trait. And you can see by controlling birth weight, we really fixed um, our calming ease problem that was a problem back here, and our genetic trend has continued to improve with re um, in relation to comparing it to the breed average. Once again, the breed is starting to improve, but we got ourselves, uh, we were able to gain an advantage by getting genetics that had much better calving ease. Gestation length is another trait that is connected. Um, uh, you can see over time, by selecting for calving ease type genetics, we were actually inadvertently um, um, improving or making shorter gestation um, genetic cattle. So this, this graph here shows that with a gesta an average gestation length of about 283 days in Hereford cattle, we're about two days shorter than the average now. Over time, our genetic trend has improved um, markedly for that. Uh, this, we could talk about growth. Um, when we were improving, when we were trying to put a, a, a foot on the birth weight problem that we had. We did fall below the average for growth, um, but that has been fixed up in recent years as we found what are called curve benders, and I want to talk about that in a minute. But um, we now have growth that is a bit above the average. I will say though that I'm not in a growth race in, in beef cattle because I think Herefords generally grow pretty well. It's not, it's not like we don't want to continue to, to keep uh, improving the trait, but we don't need to, there's plenty of other traits we can concentrate on more. It's just about keeping up with it, I think. Um, days to calving is a fertility trait, I won't go on too long with that one. Um, one, one. One that's been important to me has been, this is carcass IMF or marbling, which is our indicator of, of meat quality. So uh, we've certainly been trying to improve meat quality in our herd and that's by measuring things such as scanning as Willie's doing over there and, uh, and selecting genetics that will drive that trait. So we also, uh, but we're able to benchmark our genetics, we also set genetic targets and I don't want to focus on this too much but I actually sit down every year and we think about, well, where do we want our EBVs to be in the future? What sort of bull are we going to buy that continues to drive our genetic gains in the traits that we want to drive? So we, we actually, we use EBVs to start to, to benchmark where we are um, and where we've been, but also to start setting future genetic um, directions that are in line with our breeding objective. Um, so, when you look at all the traits that breed plan offer, you can't improve them all f very fast. If you just pick on one trait, you could move one trait quite fast if you forget about all the rest. The thing about beef cattle breeding or breeding anything in livestock is that you can't do everything. You've got to just think about your herd you, the strengths and weaknesses in your herd and think about the traits that you want to improve most. So there are, I just have some different fonts for the ones that I'm really focusing on at the moment and there's some traits that I think we're quite comfortable in that I'm not focusing in driving. But you can't drive them all at once too fast. So I think that We've talked about most of the areas where we've used breed plan at Waruna. The last bit I want to talk about is breaking the correlations. There are traits that are correlated. Now obviously if you select for growth all the time, you've got a correlated trait in, in, in a couple of things, but particularly birth weights will go up. If you just keep selecting for growth, you'll get higher birth weights. If you keep selecting for growth, you'll get higher mature cow weights in the end. But 
there are some animals that are outliers. There are some animals that break the correlations. And by measuring all the traits, we find those animals. So this is a graph which I think is an interesting graph that shows the progress of our herd in what I call is bending the growth curve over the last 50 years. And if I can just explain the graph a bit, this lower yellow line is our herd in 1980, so that was uh, uh, nearly 50 years ago. That was that herd, sorry, 40 years ago. That uh, line there is 1990, and then 2000, 2010, and so on. So over the last 50 years, you can see that we have been able to increase growth in the herd, but we've done it with no change in birth weight. So we've kept a foot on birth weight, but we've been able to increase growth. When we started doing this, probably 20 years into it, we also recognised that we couldn't keep pushing growth and forget about the size of the cow in the end. We didn't want to grow a cow that continued to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and end up looking like a draft horse and we're still eating like a draft horse. We, wanted, we want to have a cow, we want to have animals that are born easily, born light, grow very quickly, but then stop growing so that they don't end up being too costly to maintain, particularly the cow that stays at home and eats the grass. So we call that bending the growth curve and I think it's a fantastic um, uh, example or demonstration of long-term performance recording and what you can do by measuring genetics with something like EBVs and, uh, and continually um, going towards a breeding objective. Um, the thing about EBVs, and I mentioned it before, is uh, all, all, most of the EBVs are all about single traits. But it's important to recognise that they've got to be economic, you've got to have an economic outcome in the end where you're profitable. And so we have what's called a selection index, and I know you have them in the Hereford breed here. There's a ter terminal and a maternal index. But we have four indexes in Australia. And they're really, uh, an index is just like an EBV for profit, where it balances all these EBVs into a single EBV that if you can, if, if, that will improve the economic position or, or the economic proposition that these genetics will um, offer to the commercial beef industry. Um, and I think the selection index is really easy for commercial beef producers. So that is the, what we call the grain-fed steer index in Australia. You can see uh, that we weren't always above the breed, but certainly over the last 20 years, we've been, on a, um, we've been certainly more focused on making sure that the economic outcomes of genetics are better. And this is the same graph, but just shows that the um, that our trend has been double over double that of the breed average, where um, we have been improving genetics by uh, $7.60 or thereabouts per cow joined uh, per year, and the breed is at $3. So uh, the challenge out there is to make sure, uh, for me, is to make sure that I continue to have a genetic mix of traits that become more and more profitable for my uh, commercial clients. So thank you. That's a cow herd who I, um, um, a photo of a cow herd who, who we provide bulls for. Um, they have 2,000 cows that go around in one mob and that could be all 2,000 of them there. So uh, that just gives you a bit of an idea of some of the scale of some of the, uh, the Hereford breeders that we might be thinking about back in uh, Australia. But thank you very much.